Hello everyone, this is Ali, and the second episode of Unfinished Battle, where the great battles of the Warcraft law would be reenacted in order to understand how they would have happened if the fight had been fair. Many duels in the story can be lacking in their description. Some fights are interrupted, resolved through special and unfair advantage, and they may end up simply unfinished. Thinking that is what we're doing here. I'm French and English is not my native language. Correct me in the comments if you hear any mistake. The unfinished battle we're about to settle is the one that concluded the Third War and basically the entire Warcraft series before World of Warcraft was released. It took place at the end of a war of a frozen throne, opposing Illidan Stormrage and his Illidari, threatened by Kil'jaeden into taking on the Lich King for him, and the remnants of a scourge that Arthas Menethil managed to gather to protect his master. The battle occurred at the base of a frozen throne, right in the icy desert of Ice Crown, and ended with a one-on-one -on -one duel between Illidan and Arthas to get to the Lich King. After a short and brutal fight between the two, Arthas slashed across Illidan's chest and left him to die in the snow, before climbing the stairs at the command of Lich King to destroy the frozen throne and equip the Helm of Domination. The two spirits fused, and now equipped with the body of Arthas, the Lich King sat in silence at the top of his spire for years, while Illidan fled back to Outland. It's actually a bit hard to determine that fight was fair. Arthas had been losing all of his powers due to the weakening of the Lich King's power, but once he got to the frozen throne, he channeled all of his mind into the Death Knight, since he was the last line of defense. It is very possible that, having been imbued by the full might of the Scourge, Arthas might have been much more powerful than he normally is, this giving him an unfair advantage against Illidan. How would the duel have turned out if Arthas had to rely only on his own power, just like his opponent? Since this is an unfinished battle, we consider them as the were during their duel and determine who should have been the victor. The drums of war thunder once again. Illidan Stormrage was an immortal male night elf who eventually became a half demon, born 10,000 years before the first war in the village of Lorlafell with his twin brother Malfurion. The latter was born with silver eyes, while Illidan was born with amber eyes, something considered to be the sign of a great destiny. This pushed Illidan to seek power and prove worthy of his destiny, while Malfurion learned to be patient and let go of his ego. Both growing up in Suramar alongside the priestess Tiranda Whisperwind, who they were both in love with, they studied highborn magic and were secretly kept Druidism by the demigod Cenarius. The nature magic requiring humility and inner peace, Illidan abandoned it to his twin and instead became a very capable sorcerer, rivaling the best of ever mages. Their lives were turned upside down with the operating start of the War of the Ancients where Illidan, Tyranda and Malfurion led the Night Elven Rebellion against the Highborn and the Burning Legion. Despite the dire times they faced together, Illidan grew more and more jealous to see that Tyranda's affections were exclusively to Malfurion. This led him to search for more and more power, thinking this was the way to impress her, and when Malfurion came up with a desperate plan of destroying the Well of Eternity, the greatest source of power there was, Illidan was enraged. He set off on his own to deceive Ashara and pretend to serve her in order to obtain enough power to defeat the Burning Legion, although he kept growing more and more afraid of it and fascinated at the same time. Presented to Sargeras himself, who sensed Illidan's potential, he struck a deal for power with the Dark Titan. Power in exchange for his eyes. Sargeras burned them and covered his body with tattoos cleaning with fair energy granting him the ability to see the world through magic and wield incredible power as the first demon hunter. 
It didn't use his power and the highborn's resources to obtain the demon soul, a mighty draconic artifact, and brought it back to the rebellion to use as a way to close the demonic portal. This worked, but the explosion made the well of eternity unstable. Before it exploded, it didn't manage to gather as much of it as it could in magical vials, and fled north after the sundering. Seeking to create a new world of eternity to preserve the power and immortality of the Nine Elves, Illidan shoved north to Mount Hyjal and emptied three vials into the lake. However, when his people climbed the mountain and found the new well, they were horrified as magic had proved to be the flow that destroyed half of the world. Illidan argued that magic and power were the only things able to protect them against the Legion and refused to end what he was doing. Already distrustful of Illidan, the Night Elves called for him to be executed for treason, and Malfurion could only manage to have him locked up into an underground prison, guarded by the powerful wardens of Maya of Shadowsong. Fiercely attached to her duty, Maya grew obsessed with keeping Illidan where he was for eternity. A half mad Illidan was freed 10,000 years later during the Third War by his lost love to run by Whisperwind called upon him to face the invading Burning Legion again. He did not agree and ravaged the ranks of the demons before meeting a strange knight coming from the east. This human, Arthas Menafil, was a servant of the Lich King, a mighty creature of the demon lord Kil'jaeden, and betrayed the Legion by indicating to Illidan the location of a skull of Gul'dan, an immense source of power. Illidan feuded with the power of the skull and became a half-demon, growing hoofs, horns and wings and becoming much more powerful than he already was, enough to kill Tichondrius, the Nathrezim leader of Nivasian. However, when Malfurion witnessed Hiridan's demonic features, he thought his brother had fully betrayed the Night Elves and permanently banished him. Without purpose, Hiridan began working for Kil'jaeden, pursuing his endless quest of power. The demon lord commanded him to destroy the Lich King, his traitorous servant, and Illidan proceeded by enlisting the help of Naga led by Lady Varj, who remembered his power during the War of the Ancients. His plan was to travel to the Broken Eyes, whose location he knew from the memories of the Skull of Gul'dan, and use the power of the Tomb of Sargeras to destroy the entire North Rand. He was however opposed and pursued by Maya of Shadowsong, bent on getting revenge, accompanied by Tyrande and Malfurion, and while he managed to damage the Frozen Throne, Illidan was stopped and ran away to the Eastern Kingdoms, still hunted. There, he had to survive against the Night Elves, the Blood Elves alive they had found there and the forces of the Scourge. The conflict was resolved when Tyrande was betrayed and stranded by Maiel, who abandoned her in order not to lose Illidan. Malfurion expelled her for this, and the brothers allied to rescue the women they both loved from the scourge. Once the battle was over, they agreed to part peacefully, and Illidan fled to Outland, knowing he would be pursued by the wrath of Kil'jaeden. Maiev chased him there and captured him, but Illidan was rescued by Lady Varge and the new allies she had brought him, the Blood Elves and Kael'thas Sunstrider. The Highborn army formed a group known as the Illidari, led by Illidan, and recruited the Ashtung tribe of Broken led by Akama to defeat the Burning Legion in Outland and conquer what was left of the planet. Their success was short-lived, however, as Kil'jaeden confronted them at Black Temple and forced them to go after the Lich King again or be destroyed. The Illidari complied and stormed Northrend, only to be met and crushed by Arthur's Menethil at the base of the Frozen Throne. Almost dead, Illidan has his troop retreat to Outland now a full enemy of the Legion. Now at war against the most dangerous force in the universe, it is then ruthlessly secured control of the planet, while launching assaults on demon worlds and inflicting unprecedented damage against them. The Edadari notably succeeded in forming an order of demon hunters, created a new fountain of magic called the Shrine of Lost Souls, which they used to bring demons to betray the Legion and join them. They destroyed Nafreza, homeworld of the North regime. Illidan intended to do the exact same thing to Argus, and Kil'jaeden understood the magnitude of the threat. 
The Burning Legion commanded Doom Lord Kazak to reopen the Dark Portal so that a force invading force could attack Azeroth, looming the Alliance and the Horde to cross into our clan and face the corrupted Illidaris. War inevitably erupted, and Illidan failed to focus on the breaking of his own ranks. Kael'thas and Strider, eager for power, abandoned him to join the Legion, while the Kamar secretly plotted with an imprisoned Maya Shadowsong to overthrow Illidan. Thaj having been killed by the Shatar and Illidan being entirely focused on his quest to reach Argus, he was overthrown and killed in the Black Temple by the Shatar, the Alliance and the Horde, led by Maiev and Nakama. This was not his end, however. As a being close to a demon, Illidan's soul is eternally linked to the Twisting Neva, and it can only be truly destroyed there. Intending to punish him for all eternity, Maiev took his body and soul to the Broken Eyes, where she throws him and his demon hunters into fair crystals created for their own power. Years later, an alternate cooldown guided by the corrupted Cordana Fell Song stormed the vault and stole it Eden's body in order to allow Sargevas to take it for himself. Gul'dan separated the soul from the body and Illidan's spirit was cast into the Twisting Never, from which he gave the directions he could to his followers. Guided by the echo of the Prime Nar Ruxera, believing that Illidan is a child of light and shadow, destined to bring about the end of the Burning Legion, the Horde and Alliance sought to bring him back and save his soul from Helheim where it had been captured by the Falling Keeper Helia. Led by Khadgar, the enemies of the Legion stormed Suramar, where Gul'dan was conducting the ritual to bind Illidan's body to the Dark Titan. He defeated the Orc, who was eventually killed by Illidan himself, resurrected by those who had felled him. Now allied with the armies of Legion Fall to defeat Kyrgyz in save the universe, Illidan leads one of the most prominent role of the Legion expansion, and will no doubt be a character of major influence in the future of World of Warcraft. Arthur Smenethil was an adult human male born in the capital of Lordaeron, four years prior to the First War. As the second child and firstborn son of King Terranas Menethil II and Queen Leon Menethil, Arthas was the crown prince of Lordaeron and was raised as such alongside Varian Bryn, trained in Swarzen's ship by Merlin Bronzebeard and in the light by Uther the Lightbringer himself. When he was still a young man, Arthas was the third his first steed, that he named Invincible, and his soul was truly hurt for the first time when said Steve died after an accident caused by Arthas's negligence. This event caused the young prince to vow he would never let anything of the sort happen again, but he would never fail those in need of him. After becoming a paladin at age 19 and formally joining the Order of the Silver Hand, Arthas became the famed hero of his kingdom by defeating tribes of trolls and orcs who still roam the land. Having a budding romance with Jaina Pramu, the daughter of Dalin Pramu and disciple of Antonidas, the prince was promised to become one of the greatest kings of Lord Iran. However, his life was turned upside down by the undead plague spread in his kingdom by the cult of the damned and the servants of the Lich King, as he was forced to battle his greatest foe yet alongside Jaina and Uther, with little hope of victory. Arthas became increasingly frustrated by his failure to protect his people and drove Medivh away when the sorcerer tried to warn him of the dangers to come. When the priest arrived in Stratholme to confront his enemy, the dreadlord Morganus, he understood that the whole city had already been poisoned, that the only thing he could do was to murder his own people to prevent the rise of even more undead. Jaina and Uther tried to prevent him to do so, but the prince responded by officially disbanding the Order of the Silver Hand for treason. Stratholme was eventually purged by his hand, but Malganus escaped him, laughing, and daring Arthas to pursue him into the frozen wastes of Northrend. The prince took up the bait and saved the North with the First Legion, ignoring the orders of his father to stay in Lordaeron. In Northrend, Arthas met Muradin Bronzebeard, gone on an expedition to uncover the legendary cursed sword, Frostman, said to lay in Northrend, and both agreed that the blade could help them tramp the forces of Morganus. While searching for it, 
Officer's army received official command from King Terenus to return home, and the prince, refusing to let go of his revenge, hired ogre and troll mercenaries to burn down the fleet and force his troops to stay. He then betrayed the Selsuit, blaming them for the crime, and ordered his armies to destroy them, descending further and further into ruthlessness. His army ended up being surrounded by the Scourge, and Arthas went to fight Frostman with Muradin, unheeding the warnings of the spirits trying to block his path. The sword led in a chunk of cursed ice, and on its days was inscribed, Whomsoever take up this blade shall wield power eternal. Just as the blade rends flesh, so must power scar the spirit. Merlin tried to warn Arthas, but the paladin discarded his hammer and reclaimed Frostmurn, freeing it from an explosion of ice that almost killed the dwarf. And caring, Arthas went back to battle and slew a surprise Morganis with a blade, before noticing the dark whispers oozing from its metal. The prince then disappeared in the snow, surrendering his soul to madness. Arthas eventually returned to Lord Iran, transformed into a cruel death knight at the command of a lich king. He murdered his father, and had embarked on a quest to resurrect Kelfuzad, the leader of the cult of the damned, whom he had killed himself. The first step was killing his mentor Uther in combat to sire the sacred urn of his father to carry Kelfuzad's remains, and then Arthas marched north to bring it to the Sunwell of the Eye Hills the only source of power potent enough for such a feat. On his way, the Death Knight ripped Quel'Thalas apart, killing the king and Astyan Sinstrada and turning the ranger general Sylvanas Windrunner into a howling banshee before reaching his goal and plunging the course of Kel'Thuzad into the Sunwell. The necromancer rose up as a powerful lich, corrupting and wasting the fountain of power. Arthas's new lieutenant revealed the actual plan of the Lich King to him, using the Scourge to prepare for the summoning of Archimon the Defiler, and bring about the second coming of the Burning Legion. The prince obliged, and invaded Dalaran to steal the Book of Medi from Antonidas, with which Kelfus had called forth the Demonic armies to prepare for the burning of the world. Having conquered most of Lordaeron, the Legion travelled west to Nordrasil, crushed the Night Elves' last line of defense. The Lich King knew the demons would discard him if they triumphed, and he commanded Arthas to undermine the Legion's ethers by helping Hidden Stormrage to steal the Skull of Gul'dan and slay Chikundrius, making him a powerful enemy of the demons. Once the Legion had lost battle, Arthas returned to reign upon Lordaeron as its new king, but was met with rebellion for Varimatras, Vanaza, and Jephrog the three Nathrezen commanders of the Scourge, and from undead rebels led by Sylvanas Windrunner, who had managed to escape the grasp of the Lich King's power. Arthas's master had been wounded, and the Death Knight was commanded to go at his side to protect him from Illidan's storm rage, sent against the Scourge by Kil'jaeden the Deceiver. The Death Knight had to leave his kingdom with Kilfuzad's help and crossed Northren by traveling underground, as his power weakened further and further. At the base of a frozen throne, Arthas defeated Illidan in an epic duel and rose atop of a spire to destroy the throne and uncover the Helm of Domination, the seat of the Lich King's power. Arthas put the helm on his own head, fusing his spirit with that of the Lich King, becoming him. Arthas, as the new Lich King, battled the spirit of Nurzul within himself for five years, unmoving from his frozen seat. The human won the battle and finally took command on the entire forces of the Scourge, unleashing his plagues and frost worms upon Orgrimmar and Stormwind. The Alliance and the Horde unleashed their armies in Northrend to stop him, allied with the treacherous Death Knights of the Avon Blade, and war raging in the frozen wastes. During the Battle of the Wrath Gate, Arthas was wounded with a new plague brewed against him by the apothecaries of the Forsaken, but eventually survived, reclaiming the bodies of Janash Sawathang and Bolvar Thordragon. Scheming to gather the greatest champions of Azeroth for his armies, Arthas led the Argent Crusade led by Tyrion Thordring's settlement to Ice Crown, challenging them to send the best warriors against him. Thordring was fooled and selected those who would storm Ice Crown Citadel with him during the Argent Tournament, 
Their full forces were cast against the scourge in the Battle of Ice Ground, where Jaina Brownmore and Sylvana Swinrunner tried to stop Arthas, before realizing how powerful and inhuman he had become. Tyrion sent his champions to fight the Lich King, who managed to kill them all, intending to raise them as his own weapons against the world. Fordering sides the occasion to strike, and shattered Frostmourne with the Holy Blade Ashbringer. The souls of Arthas' victims escaped, trapping him and raising his enemies back to life, which finally destroyed the Death Knight's body. Arthas died with no one beside him but the ghost of his father, seeing only darkness, as a spectre reminded him that no king rules forever. Tyrion Fordring intended to equip the Helm of Domination in order to become the new Lich King and contain the Scourge, but that fate eventually went to the broken Borvar Fordrigan. Illidan and Arthas may be the most famous characters of Warcraft, period. When you think Warcraft, first thing you see is the cover of Wrath of the Lich King, and Illidan's character is so beloved that pure fandom power brought him back from the dead. That duel was obviously a very important moment in the lore, and everything would have changed if it had gone any differently. It would be enough to create a whole new alternate timeline for World of Warcraft. Let's find out what would have happened if the Lich King had not been able to empower Arthas. My child, I watched with pride as you grew into a weapon of righteousness. Illidan is an idol, a race descended from trolls exposed for ages to the magic of the world of eternity. As such, he was born resistant to disease, a gift for magic and immortality. Illidan went much beyond that, however, as he learned to enhance his own body with magic, and later agreed to let himself be imbued with fell power by Sargeras. From then on, Illidan was gifted with a largely enhanced strength and endurance, but his speed and agility knew no bounds, as he was sturdy and strong enough to leap into battle bare-chested. His eyes have been burned by Sargeras, but the fell fire that replaced them allows him to see directly through magical energy, and he can see almost as well as if he wasn't blind. To Illidan, fell power means physical power, as he channels it directly into his body, and when he consumed the skull of Gul'dan, he basically became half demon. Now gifted with hoofs, horns, wings, and dangerous teeth, Illidan is a powerhouse. So sturdy and fast he doesn't need armor. Additionally, he can give in to the demon within him to go even further and darken his entire body, transforming his entire body into a burning weapon. A powerful paladin before he was corrupted by Frostmoon, Arthas was always an imposing fighter and a physically strong man. When he became a Death Knight of the Scourge, the prince was gifted with necromantic abilities, which directly affected his body, even if he was technically still alive. The icy and cursed blood running through his veins made him basically immune to cold and common diseases, and made eating and sleeping unnecessary, as well as rendering him technically immortal. All this makes Arthas much more resistant to pain and fatigue of all kinds, a stronger, harder and relentless version of his former self. If, given the chance, a Death Knight can partially heal themselves by using the power of their blood and that of their enemies to increase their defense and regeneration, an Arthas is likely to possess similar abilities. Any necromantic energy surrounding him would further enhance his body. Basically, even if it remains technically human, Arthas' body gives him a supernatural endowment that exceeds mortal limits and makes him a very tough opponent. It's actually a bit difficult to determine what body is the most powerful, that of a demon hunter or that of a death knight. 
They are both enhanced through magical means to impossible heights, but if we compare, the knights still need armor and rely on brutish power. They definitely lean more on the physical side of things than the demon hunters. But if you strip them all of their equipment and spell, the speed and resistance of demon hunters would probably triumph. Besides, Illidan's wings and fast hooves give him a definite advantage against a body that maintains a human form. Illidan's storm rage wins the physical edge. Fight! Kill! Salute! Before turning to fell power, Illidan was a sorcerer, basically untrained in physical combat. He used telekinetics to wield blades against the demons, but after he was enhanced by Sargeras, he apparently gathered war glaives and took to wielding them into battle by using his speed to slaughter his enemies in a fiery blade storm. Such tactics became all the more dangerous when Illidan gained his wings and hoofs and while demon hunters rely a lot on magic, he is an extremely dangerous foe in direct combat. Trained since his earliest age by the Mountain King Muradin Bronzebeard and the Paladin Ufa the Lightbringer, Arthas was a very potent fighter long before becoming a Death Knight. He was already famous for his prowess in defending Lordaeron from pillaging orcs and trolls, and with did enough strength to effortlessly carry his heavy armor and warhammer. The bloodlust imbued in him by Frostmon made him an even more deadly fighter, using his great strength to rapidly strike with his two-handed blade. Able to measure up and defeat fighters such as Ufa the Lightbringer, Anastarian and Kael'thas and Strada, and even Illidan Stormrage himself. With no physical or mental fatigue and a weapon directly connected to his mind, Arthas is one of the most dangerous duelists of his time, one that was basically never defeated in single combat. While both combatants are deadly in combat, there's a clear difference in the fact that Illidan did not start out as a physical combatant and only uses his body as an extent of his magical powers. Even if he was stripped of all magical power, Illidan would still be an impressive fighter, but Arthas had been trained for battle since birth. Illidan's technique stemmed from his magic, not his skin in battle, and Arthas' many field must win the battle capability edge. Hold that! There's an inscription on the dais. It's a warning. It says, Whomsoever takes up this blade shall wield power eternal. Just as the blade rends flesh, so must power scar the spirit. It then holds on to little equipment, wearing only pants, waist armor and some tokens enhancing his magical abilities. The most important one is clearly the Skull of Gul'dan, a relic containing the amazing power of the Orc Warlock, which Illidan has fully tapped into. However, the most notable part of his equipment are clearly the Twin Blades of Azinoth. Double-bladed Yagged Scimitar, steaming with fell power, he looted from the body of Azinov, a doom guard he slew during the War of Ancients. Illidan's soul is bound to the blades, which allows him to summon them to his hands if he wishes so. It appears that the blades can be combined into one, and each of them can be split into two swords. Given that demon hunters tend to acquire their powers by eating the hearts of demons, it's possible that the demon's soul live on onto the blade. If need be, they can be left out of the battle to summon the flames of the Azinoth, 
sapphireelemental.com to aid the world during to combat. Clad in heavy death knight armor, adorned with skulls and often mounted on a skeletal steed, invincible, the first creature he raised to undeath and a mount who can summon whenever he pleases, Arthas's basic equipment is quite impressive indeed. Invincible has been depicted with and without wings, but Arthas never flew on his back. Despite all this, his main asset is his weapon, the rune blade Frostmoon. Forged by the anaphorism of a burning legion to be wielded by a frost death knight, it is part of the cursed items holding the soul of Ner'zhul, the Lich King. The ended all cast the blade off the frozen throne with the explicit purpose of luring one such as Arthas to take control of, whispering through the blade to possess and subdue him. The rune blade of the death knight is what allows them to channel the runic power. One cannot let go of it easily, and the destruction of Frost Moon would be a devastating blow against Arthas. Losing an icy mist, this sword may be the most famous artifact of the Warcraft universe, and only a surprise strike by the legendary Archbringer was finally able to shatter it and stop its rampage. Adding to its jagged edges, Frost Moon has the power to absorb the souls of anyone murdered with it, and hungers for more, trapping its victim forever to torment them. If the blade was to be destroyed, all the ghosts inside would be released in a ghastly explosion. But it is so sturdy and dangerous that this is almost impossible. Well, there's hardly anyone that can measure up to Arthur's benefit in the equipment department. Also, the war glaives of Azinov are fantastic weapons. They don't compare to Frost Moon, and Illidan simply doesn't have armor. Since demon hunters do not rely on their equipment, it appears that Arthas Menethil must win the equipment edge. All my life I have lived by the sword. I've seen kingdoms burn and watched brave heroes die in vain. As a veteran of the War of the Ancients, Illidan faced the greatest conflict there was and proved to be an astounding general, taking command of the Moon Guard despite his inexperience and culling the ranks of a burning legion without mercy. Illidan was ready to commit any sacrifice in order to stop the demons, and this mindset characterized him throughout his entire life. It's what made him become a demon hunter, in order to specialize and use the enemy's power against it. Although he could not gain any experience during his very long life, the most of which he spent in prison, the devastating damage he inflicted upon the Burning Legion after he was free proved his talent for war. He killed the leader of the invasion by himself, conquered the outland and came close to destroying the Lich King. Despite being one warrior, Eden has a knack for command and always finds a way to harness fantastic power to use as a weapon of mass destruction against his enemies. He knows no limits, and will always go for the most dire and effective methods, including torture, enslavement, genocide and planetary destruction. His one weakness, the one that got him into jail and cost him the battle of the Black Temple, is his inability to take notice of the point of view of others and focus on anything else but the revenge driving him. His insanity means that not even death will stop him from fighting on, and he managed to lead the Illidari from the Twisting Lever despite his death. Now, after being opposed by the entire world, and basically the entire universe, he didn't have come again to be the battle commander of the armies of Legion 4 know that his goals have aligned with those of Azeroth's denizens. The Burning Legion considers him to be the greatest threat it has ever encountered. Trained to rule as kings since his earliest age, 
Arthur's Menefield has been prepared by the best of his time to be a world leader ready to face horrors comparable to those of the Second War. At the beginning of Warcraft 3, he was still somewhat new to command, even as an efficient knight of the Silver Hand, but Uther already commands his prowess against the Court of the Damned. Ready to face dire extremes in order to accomplish his goals, Arthur is the kind of warrior who will never give up or let himself be discouraged against his enemies. As a death knight, with a direct console of the Lich King available to him, he is even more ruthlessly efficient, as proof his victories against Lord Aron, Querfalas and Dalaran. He is more of a direct captain and tactician than a large-scale strategist, something that is shown in Warcraft 3 where all his movements are dictated and or advised by Nerzul and Kelfuzev, and his determination can overcome him with frustration and anger, blinding him to the traps that may have been set against him. When he became the leader of the entire Scourge, his classical army tactics were actually less efficient than Nerzul's subtle maneuvers. And we know that had he merely unleashed the undead against the world, none could have stopped them. Despite this, if he is set in a battlefield, Arthas can be called a commander able to rise in triumph from any situation. Nidans should basically always win round 4, given their age, but Illidan's imprisonment deprives him from this advantage. However, his direct experience makes him more than a match in war against Arthas. The Death Knight might be more efficient in micromanaging battles, but Illidan is able to wage wars and act as a leader, while Arthas relies on the orders and counsels of those who rule over him. Besides, Arthas acts out of instinct, inclination or obedience, while Illidan is able to plan forward and lie with anyone, even demons if it misses his endgame. The battle experience edge goes to Illidan's Storm Rage. In secret, I began harvesting what energies I could. I had a brief taste of true power. Starting out as a gifted highborn sorcerer, Illidan's prowess in magic made him so recognized that Asjara herself became fascinated with him, although he had eyes only for Tyrande. When he made a pact with Zargeras, all his powers were increased tenfold and he turned to the use of flame and fell magic. Since he is a master in mana manipulation and absorption, just like Blood Elves, he can burn the mana of others and manipulate their souls to burn them. As a demon hunter, he can unleash fireballs and blasts all around him and surround himself in a circle of firefire to damage the enemy. As a havoc demon hunter, Illidan can transform into a mighty demon and wreak fellfire everywhere just as he wishes, as well as any warlock but can also unleash parasitic shadow fiends that will attach themselves to his enemies and suck their souls out. Illidan can summon shadows to aid him whenever he wishes, as well as summon the flames of Azinoth, and his powerful eye beam is a force to be reckoned with. Illidan is able to fly, submit any demons he crosses, and directly see magical energy, which means he can't be fooled by invisibility spells. As a master of mana manipulation, he is capable of creating and using magical sources to great extents and can be considered to rival mages and warlocks on their own turf rather easily. As a death knight, Arthas renounced any power over the holy light he had in his previous life and replaced it with the ghastly necromantic powers of Frostmourne and the Lich King. Along with all the physical enhancements his existence as a Death Knight provides him, Arthas has been gifted with the ability to raise dead corpses around him for his service, making them all better and stronger and casting a death coil able to kill anything living, while strengthening the undead. In a pinch, he can even absorb the energy animating his minions to heal himself. 
The runic power imbued in Frost Moon lets him inflict deadly frost and shadow damage to anything he strikes, as well as absorb the soul of his victims to do as he pleases with. Even if he is not primarily a spellcaster, his supernatural body and magic Arthas have been given make him a deadly juggernaut, very hard to stop or counter, able to raise troops almost anywhere. In terms of magical mastery, his great weakness may be his rather undefended mind and his lack of actual control over his abilities. The way offered to him by Vanish King, he is not likely to develop anything new on his own or improvise with necromancy. It can be added that should the power of Nazul stop sustaining him, all of Arthas's power would immediately wane and weaken, with no recourse to get better on his own. While they are both extremely powerful magical warriors, and it could be argued that Arthas's potential is a match for Illidan's, one clear difference sets the two apart, actual magical training. Arthas is not a necromancer, and could not muster his powers without the support of the Lich King, while Illidan's power is very much his own, and he has the vast resources of it even when using it to augment his own body. The magical resources edge clearly goes to Illidan's storm range. Faith is a powerful weapon. So I'm told. The Alliance has the light from which to draw its strength. What steals this iron horde in its darkest hours? While fell magic and necromancy are two different kinds of powers, they can overlap and have one common point, the manipulation of souls as tools and energy sources. Fell is a force emanating from the chaos of a twisting nether, born from the mutual destruction of light and shadow, and can be fueled and created by the consumption of souls, something Illidan is a master of. Necromancy, on the other hand, aims at binding said souls as a direct energy source, or in a new body that becomes undead and can be manipulated in the same way. It is not only common for powerful warlocks and necrolites to know how to use the other form of magic. This means that Arthas' soul and those he wields can be burned away directly by Illidan, but also that he is actually able to protect his own essence and counter the shadows mastered by the demon hunter. Basically, both magics trump the other, and no edge can be gained from a magical comparison. You Pandaren tried to bury your hate and your anger, but such power cannot be contained. It must be unleashed! Eredin is a very complex character, tormented with an inferiority complex since his very birth. The gift of the Ender Eyes, actually a sign of natural talent for Druidism, pushed him to always compare to his twin Marfurian, born with silver eyes. Despite his supposed talent, Eredin's lack of patience gave him trouble in the understanding of Druidism, and Marfurian quickly became better than him. Illidan couldn't understand that, which got worse when he understood that Tyrande Whisperwind, a common love interest, was attracted only to his brother. Illidan's complex made him certain that he could gain Tyrande's love if only he demonstrated all the amazing things he could do, and his failures made him go further and further. Illidan's recklessness ended up pushing him toward a dark path. He sacrificed anything even less important than his feud against the demons, and resorted to more and more brutality, which he meant to enjoy. Whilst this made him a dreadful combatant, his lack of empathy means that he inevitably hurts and alienates everyone around him, paying no heed to the consequences. Those he does not consider dangerous, he doesn't care about. And this was what allowed Kael'thas and Akama to plan his downfall from under his nose. 
He endeavors to meet the most of armies right until the storm is forced to rescue them. His quest for power became an obsession with the destruction of a legion and the fulfillment of his revenge, and he would probably blow up half of the universe if it managed to defeat Sargeras. He is very unstable, overcome with hate, sorrow and selfishness, and the best way to play him is to count on his other confidence. From the day he was born, the expectations associated to the throne of Lordaeron were rested upon Arthas's shoulders, and they weighed heavily upon all of his actions. The death of his horse Invincible is still in sense of deep guilt in him, a guilt that pushes him to the most dire of extremes when it comes to do what he perceives as his moral duty. He is not insensible to those extremes. The cutting of Stratholme may have been the most painful thing he had to do in his entire life. His guilt drives him to actions that make him feel even more guilty, at least to a prince who doesn't stand being criticized by higher figures and will react very negatively to anyone who doesn't understand his choices. This mindset led him to stop listening to anyone that tries to warn or restrain him, and commit acts of betrayal with his duty and revenge as a justification. Such a fragile and obsessed mind was easy prey for the Lich King, who warped him into someone cynical and cruel. Certain aspects of Arthas's personality remained. He still had a form of care for his people, seeing his undead ghouls as if they were his actual subjects, still caring for his role as King of Lordaeron. His contempt and mockery toward anyone trying to shame or chide him for his actions or revenge for the perceived shackles that such people inflicted upon him in his previous life. He even shows friendship and trust towards those who serve him loyally, and is immediately outraged at the idea of surrendering the might of a scourge, his undead people, to a burning legion. When he becomes a Lich King, his rule is a ghastly parody of a medieval kingdom, complete with an official religion of Necolites and a 19 order of Death Knights in a gigantic fortress he doesn't actually need to rule. He did actually believe that those remnants of humanity were what restrained him from unleashing the full power of the Scourge, the spirit of Matthias Lena, a ghost child haunting as crown and giving the player hints concerning the Lich King's weaknesses, is actually a manifestation of his remnants, Matthias Lena, Arthur Smanifield. Arthas's mind is a conflicted one, constantly fighting about himself, which is the one weakness that led to his downfall. It's quite difficult to compare the psyches of two murderous fools corrupted by their inability to handle the inflated ego and determine which is the most stable one. Arthur is completely unable to set himself on an actual path aside from his urge to cruelly punish anyone that slights his pride. Illidan is, on the contrary, completely driven by revenge so obsessed and blood he doesn't see the dangers right at his side if he is not already focusing on it. They are, of course, horribly overconfident, and their immense power tends only to reinforce such behavior. It could be argued that the main difference between them is that Arthas is actually persuaded he found his path and solved his entire life. He truly thinks he is now the best and brightest. Eredan, on the other hand, keeps brooding and secretly hating himself, wishing he had another life where he could be with Tyranda. One can doubt and crack, not the other. This is not a bit reflected in Arthas's playful tendency to aggravate Illidan's temper whenever they mean by sarcastically humiliating him. Basically, Arthas has learned to ignore his own issues, while Illidan is eating inside by them. This is a slight psychological edge to Arthur's manifold. To ask why we fight is to ask why the leaves fall. It is in their nature. Perhaps there is a better question.
The fight would occur at the base of a frozen throne, just like it did in Warcraft 3. Arthas would need all the advantages he has at his disposal and would face Illidan and Invincible, arriving as the demon hunter that's gotten to the entrance. Knowing this fight would be necessary, Arthas would charge, force more chipped onward. Expecting this mission to reduce the speed of his adversary, Illidan's first move would be to dash to the side and throw one of his claves at the horse's legs to cut through. The size of the war glaives and invincible speed would make it impossible to escape, but the horse has a trick Illidan can't expect. His wings would spread and the Death Knight would take flight, flying right above the incoming blade. Neither would surely be surprised, but would quickly react by hurling fell fireballs at the flying knight, and Arthas's only option would be to maneuver in the air and dance around the frozen spire to try and avoid the missiles. A pissed off Edidon would take flight too, and an unborn battle would ensue. The demon hunter would be the pursuer in this, since he has far greater maneuverability in the air. He would use all the extent of his sudden hand speed to catch up to Invincible while firing spells at Arthas, and the Death Knight would know he could not keep this up for long without being struck down. Trying to use his death call to stop Illidan, Arthas would expect to surprise his enemy and turn back to repay him. However, Illidan has seen worse attacks and would just dive through the call in order to burn the human. Both combatants would crash against one another in an outburst of death and flame before crashing back into the snow. Both of them would be violently hurt, but the body of Invincible would have saved them. Laying down onto the snow, both on one side of Invincible, they would need a minute to get back up and fight. Illidan would be the first to rise, and he would summon his flame cloak to hurt Arthas immediately before quickly attempting to decapitate the Death Knight. The human would easily parry with Frostmourne, however, and summon high spikes from the ground to counter the flames and repair his opponent. Illidan would just jump on the other side and harass Arthas with a flurry of attacks from the war blades of Azenar. The Death Knight would have to use the entire extent of his talent for battle to survive, using his sword and armor to survive the fury of the demon hunter, just like he did in the main timeline. Arthas would soon prove his superior strength, and Illidan would be forced back away with a flap of his wings, followed by a powerful slash from Frostmourne. If the Death Knight hadn't been backed by the power of the Lich King, this would have been enough to put Illidan out of commission, but here, Arthas would be slow enough that the Demon Hunter could parry again and escape even further away. Knowing that Arthas is far more dangerous at close range, Illidan would not be keen on letting the Death Knight reach him. He would summon shadows to rush upon Arthas and paralyze him, locking him in place. Arthas would start hacking away at them, using Frost Moon's power to dispatch the incorporeal attackers, but this would take time, enough for Illidan to cast parasitic shadow fiends upon the enemy. This would be heavy on his mana resources, but Arthas himself would have trouble fighting back, given his soul's connection to his body is non-direct. Needing help to fend off Illidan's shadow minions, Arthas would call upon the Shades in service to the Scourge and use Frost Moon's absorption power to survive. He would have no problem to come out the victor, but this is not the end of Illidan's onslaught. The Demon Hunter would throw both war glaives of Azinoth upon Arthas. He would parry with great difficulty, now having to rely on the Lich King's desperate help to protect his soul. Both blades would land behind Arthas, exactly as Illidan had planned. The Demon Hunter would summon the flames of Azinoth from a distance, and both Fellfire Elementals would attack Arthas by behind. The Death Knight, now in a very bad position, would use all the soul powers he is absorbing to repel the flames with icy spikes and rise under the minion through the numerous corpses littering ice crown to help him survive. Again. He is more hurt than Illidan and in a bad position, but Arthas is strong enough to fight what Illidan is sending at him and eventually win. What he doesn't know is that this is a setup of a night elf, and in the time it would take Arthas to get rid of the shadows and flames, Illidan would fire his eye beam upon him at full power before he has a chance to dodge. 
The only defense Afas could muster against this would be to have his ghouls rush in front of him to act as shields and lessen the blow, but the beam would blast right through them and strike him harder than he had ever been struck. The energy unleashed would have killed most people easily. Arthur survived as there is now a gaping hole in his armor and a hideous fell wound in his chest. Sure, pain barely affects him, but still, the blood hurt. As he slowly rises up, Illidan would dash at magnet speed while summoning his war glaze back to his hands, ready to hand his enemy. Expecting this, Arthur would not move and just wait as Illidan leaps down at him, and at the last moment, Death Knight would absorb the false life of all his servants back to himself, regenerating some of his energy and cast chains of ice and chill. Naturally surprised it him, and would not be able to fight back when Arthas would violently draw him down. Although the Night Elf would try to defend himself, False Moon would shatter his defense and maybe destroy one of the war glaives before impaling him. The power balance has thus been completely inverted. Although very hurt, Arthas has much of his runic power still available to him, while Illidan has been mortally wounded and has depleted almost the entirety of his energy. Laughing heartily, Arthas would start brutally draining the soul of the Chimic Hunter, getting revenge for all the trials he had gone through to save the Lich King. This would enrage Illidan beyond belief, make him completely unable to accept death and defeat even while pierced through and feeling his life peeling away. Using the power of his immortal demon soul and his mastery of the fell, Illidan's spirit would fight back, both in the physical realm and inside Frostmoor, and bring forth the twisting nether within the realm of the blade. Illidan knows how to consume souls and convert them into fell power, and to Arthas's frustration, the demon hunter would manage to resist the absorption, even as he seems to be dying. Inside Frostmoor, Illidan would distort the rule of a Lich King by bringing pure chaos in and doing what he does best, setting martyrs ablaze with a burning need for revenge. And Frostmoor is full of furious souls, willing to sacrifice themselves against revenge on Arthas and the Lich King. Frostmoor has been fought by Narthazim, and Illidan knows everything about that. The spirit of Nurzel would attack Illidan's furious to be fought on his own turf, but the demon hunter would respond by converting all the soul power inside Frostmourne into pure fell chaos, destroying the power of the runes. In the physical realm, Frostmourne would turn to a sick green and suddenly stop responding to Arthas, to his complete astonishment. Fell energy would start flowing from it, furnishing the body of a dying Illidan with power. Transforming fully into a dark demon, the Night Elf would smash his fist in Arthas' face and rip Force One out of his gut, letting the fell fire cut her eyes with deep wound. Arthas would fall on the ground, actually terrified of what's happening. Illidan, laughing maniacally, would start hacking away the human with his own soul before forcing the last of its soul energy to blow up with the remains of a death knight. All that would remain of Arthas' manifold would be his armor, bones and burned blood. Illidan, reverting back to his normal form and getting his weapon back, would just lop hysterically at his victory and start limping back towards the frozen throne, walk leave of Azinov in hand. Now, he can finish his mission and change everything, or maybe find a new power created by Kildanian to strike it against the Legion. The Scourge would make an amazing tool for the Illidari. Either way, the Lich King's fate is forfeit. Oh yes, finally someone manages to convincingly destroy Frostmourne. This was so much more satisfying than I bring us cheap code. Arthas's power is dreadful, largely capable of taking on Illidan, and had he been just a bit more powerful, his physical state would have surpassed the Demon Hunters and won him the fight. Here, he didn't experience magic and driven need for revenge made him able to go all the way, inventing new ways to fight and turn Arthas's power against him. As long as he managed to stay away from Arthas, Illidan was clearly superior, and he had the speed and wings to do exactly that. 
there was a thousand ways this path could have gone, but given the circumstances, this was the outcome to expect. The winner is Illidan Stone Rage, the betrayer, Lord of the Adari. So glad I did this one. I actually glad this went this way. A win for Malthus would have been a bit redundant. When you look at the fight this way, it makes sense for Illidan to be a raid boss and such a great player in the war against the Burning Legion. The way he will probably evolve makes using him in one of us a bit difficult for now, and I hope I'll be able to use him again in other unfinished battle birds and such. Next time, a much less serious fight between two much smaller opponents. Galvin make a talk, Hiding Curtain King of the Gnomes, and Jastor Gallywix, Trade Prince of the Bitrother Carter of the Old Goblins. Should be completely crazy. Like to support the channel and subscribe if you want to be updated on the new videos. Bye until then.